involved with the number of kids who were able to pull it off, which makes me think it's possible if one you know, works at it. Let me, yes, last one in the book. effort. 
certain asceticism into her life. Whereas I think she needs to consciously introduce ascetical practices, that is, particular disciplines that she's able to work at and accomplish and, and make it fly, make it work over a period of time. And I think that I want to start out with some sort of discipline that she really can do to give her a sense of confidence. So maybe instead of attacking her eating problem, first of all, I want to deal with something like get her to do some spiritual reading each day, which she doesn't do, but which seems very possible because she's not dealing with the same sort of compulsive feeling here. So the discipline would be, okay, let's set this up. Why don't you try and do 10 minutes of spiritual reading at least three times a week? And, and, and what I hope happens is, is that she does it. And then after doing it, she says, geez, I can do that. Now, we introduce that kind of asceticism to give us a feeling that, that discipline is not only possible, but good for us. That we end up functioning better. So I got to give her a general outlook on asceticism that says we don't do these things because um, we think the world is bad or because we think the body's an evil thing. Ascetical practices have the purpose of bringing us closer to God, of helping us to become more whole people, of becoming more mature individuals. It's got a positive thrust to it. We Christians are not masochists. We don't inflict punishment on ourselves for no other purpose. It's always for the sake of growth, of development, of coming closer to God. In fact, if we come up against some discipline here that just it seems impossible and just messes her head up because she constantly fails, so she's out, she, then maybe we don't want to do it. It's like people who give up smoking during Lent and then are just a bitch to live with. No, and, and they end up feeling good because they didn't smoke, but they messed up everyone else's lives. <laughs> so, I mean, my theory would be if that was the end product of this, well, forego the patting oneself on the back after six weeks. I didn't smoke for six weeks. I'm a neat person. Give that up. <laughs> Give up the pat on the back for Lent. <laughs> One of the disciplines that, of course, that has been uh, talked about throughout is that of fasting. And um, I think that there is something good about fasting. Again, you know the history we used to have this fasting where you counted uh, amounts of food, you had one main meal and then two others that couldn't equal that one and so on. And there was a lot of uh, odd talk about that. We were going to abstain and then we had in the Catholic Encyclopedia answers to questions about whether you broke your abstain period by swallowing dogs. <laughs> Oh, oh, oh. 
that fasting is going to be a way for her to uh, substitute diet because that isn't going to work. But she might want to try it as a way of sort of seeing if she's able to control eating in any way. And if she can't, I don't want her to make a big thing out of it. I want to just get that burden off of her. But if she can do something along that line, she might be able to introduce better dietary habits in general and, and do better with her eating. In the notes, you'll find a section on uh, the medical, physical side of fasting, all of which should be erased. Um, what I did is, is look through books on fasting by spiritual authors who quoted doctors and scientists and so on, and they say fasting does everything for you. It gives you more energy, clears out the blood, uh, helps the elimination process, you know, it's the greatest thing in the world for health. Well, I uh, talked to uh, an expert on this, and uh, who's up on the latest scientific literature and so on, and he told me, wrong. <laughs> <laughs> he says, as near as he can figure, fasting doesn't do anything good for you that way. Um, it doesn't do any of those things that the literature says it does, and the spiritual authors say. He said, on the other hand, it won't hurt you <laughs> if you're healthy. I mean, you shouldn't fast if you're pregnant or if you're past the age when you should fast. Um, sick in some way. So he said, make sure you tell the people that. But the summary, he told me a whole bunch of stuff, which I found very interesting. I'm not going to go into all of it. But the essence of it was, it doesn't do all those good things for you, and it's not a good way to initiate a diet at all, uh, because you need lifelong eating patterns, not uh, fasting for a couple of days. And, uh, but it won't hurt you. Which again, and what I got out of it was it frees you up to say, if I want to fast for spiritual reasons, then this might be good. And I can introduce this as a way of getting my focus keeping things in perspective that, you know, the needs of life and the body are not all of them. There is something deeper that needs to be right. i got to have the right relationship with the one who's running the world, uh, the one we call God, and that's got to be my focus, and the fasting helps remind me of that. I, I have friends who fast regularly who say that it clears their mind, that it focuses their attention. That they, they, act, they, they say things that you find in the spiritual literature, like it gives them more energy and all kind of things like that. I've heard that from a number of people, and I really don't know what to make of it, except I presume that works for them. I personally just get headaches. <laughs> <laughs> I've never found you can get beyond that stage. But, uh, well, let's think of it in terms of other things. Think of the people who fast for justice. People, uh, you know, Gandhi was big on that, Martin Luther King, before you go on a march, you fast. Here we have the fast for world harvest, and there always seems to be something about the solidarity, be with other people who are fasting, and then we have a simple soup supper together, and you're there, and everyone's sort of hungry, and there's a solidarity, and a reminder again that there's more to life than just feeding the body. There's a the concern for those who don't have food, and those who are suffering in some way. So it seems like it creates a solidarity and reminds us of the need to work for justice. I believe that, you know, some of those good things happen.
spiritual book that works. In other words, uh, as you can tell through us, I, I like to find things that actually enable us to make progress. Anyway, find the book and begin to read it. You know, say a prayer before you start. With one so God's presence, read deeply a few times to get in. Start reading, and then when you get to a place that you like, a sentence strikes you, a verse that it pulls you up short or provides in some way, then stop. And then to mull it over, think about it, and apply it. And say, you know, what does this have meaning be in my life? So I think the example last Tuesday came to mind as you start reading in the Annunciation account in Luke. And you're reading along, and it, and it suddenly strikes you, well, I wonder how Mary was so receptive like that. That's interesting, you know. She was right there, able to respond. That's an interesting point. And then you can stop and think about it. Well, I wonder why Mary was like that. Well, maybe it's because she prayed regularly. And because she prayed regularly, when the big moment came, she was ready and able to handle it. That's interesting. Maybe I'd be more ready to handle the challenges if I prayed regularly. So we reflect on it, mull it over, think about it, meditate on it. And then, after that, we try to let that lead us into prayer. So then we pray to God about it. Lord, help me to improve my own prayer life. Or, I'm sorry for the times I've just neglected that for weeks on end. Or, I want to praise you for your goodness. So we let it lead into prayer. And then when the distractions come, or that sort of line of thought is played out, then you pick the book back up again, start reading again, just go along quietly, slowly, don't worry about it, keep going, going, then some next verse hits you, stop again, and do the same thing. That method of prayer was started in the Eastern monasteries, and we we're back in the early Christian era, and then it was taken to the West and uh, introduced by St. Benedict in the 6th century into, into the Western monastic tradition and has been a big part of uh, prayer ever since. Lexio Divina, the sacred reading method. It's a beautiful method and for people who have trouble concentrating, it's great because you can read until something actually comes to you and then you can try to apply it to one's everyday life. It's therefore known as a Benedictine method of prayer. Uh, let's do our one-to-one uh, -one discussion on uh, asceticism and Lexio Divina and see if that is. Oh, <laughs> 
So what we do is introduce the Ignatian method of prayer. Now fundamentally, the Ignatian method of prayer builds on the imagination. It's found in the spiritual exercises. What we do in this prayer is not try to clear out images, but get them in there. And we try to put ourselves back into biblical scenes. So we try to get back into the woman at the well, and we pretend like we're a spectator there. We're hanging around the well, and uh, we're listening to Jesus interact with this person. And we're trying to get ourselves into it as much as we can. And we think about how uh, Jesus said it, and what he said, and how the woman felt. And then we try to engage all of our senses. We try to think about how the cool water would have been to taste. Oh, and we uh, see the woman there, what kind of a woman she was, what kind of person. Oh, and we uh, listen closely to the words of the Lord. We catch the smells around the well there. So we try to use all of our senses to engage ourselves, to put ourselves into this scene. And then we try to reflect on that. We begin to say, well, what does this mean? And uh, what's this all about? And then we try to let that lead us into prayer. Now, if you take your notes in hand here, second page, under row, uh, capital letter C, we find the Benedictine method first, which we talked about as Lexio Divina, sacred reading, and then right under it comes the Ignatian method that we have from the spiritual exercise, a little background on St. Ignatius and so on. And then we go through the method. Begin with the scene from the scriptures, place yourself in it, imagine all five senses, reflect on the meaning, listen to what the Lord might be telling you, resolve, and an important point, resolve to do something about responding to this invitation, and then express gratitude for what went on. Now, that's sort of how it goes in the spiritual exercise. Well, I called up my good friend, uh, Father Jim Lewis, over at Jay Zoo, and I, who does a lot of directing along this line, and uh, he was going to be here tonight, incidentally, to uh, do this bit himself now, but he had to, when it was on Tuesday, he could be here, he couldn't be here tonight. So I, what I did is talk to him about uh, how he would do it. Now, where it says some advice from a director, that's Father Jim Lewis is saying how he would tell somebody to do this. He has him daydream with the scripture passage. Read it three or four times. Close eyes and so on. Be either a participant or an onlooker. It's uh, sometimes fun to become one of the characters, like now I am the woman talking to Jesus. Then he says it's important to let your imagination roam freely. Don't say, well, you know, if you're doing the, the scene at the, in the nativity and you're in this cave with Mary and Joseph and uh, some guy walks in who's neither a king nor a shepherd, uh, <laughs> well, you, you just, you don't say, well, I must be off the track. You, 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 you go with that because it's probably revealing. So you let your imagination roam. You're not worried about being accurate here. And then um, you go through the scene, whole scene once and then go back to the points that struck you that either made you feel good or brought some sort of uh, heavy feeling. And then he says that he thinks that this uh, using the five senses is really a crucial part of all of this. And that it's oftentimes he says that when people get into that, really focusing on all five of their senses, that they will find out an 
That is to write down every day by, or every couple days uh, what's going on in his life. I wanted to do this because I don't want this to go badly again. I want to know if it goes badly this time, next year when he comes back, I want to know why. So I wanted to, to write down what's happening while he's doing all of this. And uh, in the Bible, as we do say here, you know, he might uh, write down his dreams. He might down how he felt while he was doing the spiritual exercises. He might write uh, down the snatches of conversation or a quote that he read throughout the day. Uh, journaling seems to be uh, helpful to many people. It's probably good to put it in context to think of the great journals like Pope John, uh, Pope John the Twenty Third uh, Journal of the Soul or Dag Hammarskjöld's Markings. In other words, a lot of people who wrote down their thoughts, and when you read them, they're really inspiring. You think, wow, this is neat. That must have really helped them. So you're trying to get a little feel for what it would mean to keep a journal. In the notes, you find all kinds of suggestions from my friend George Simons, who's written books on this. And, um, periodically comes to Toledo and is on my radio program a number of times and so on. He's sort of the reigning guru on journal writing, I think, um, at least from the spiritual side, I should say. And uh, anyway, George has got a lot of suggestions on, on how we go about this. Uh, it's important to write freely and openly and not worry about what you're writing and uh, not don't monitor it or just, you know, think about how are people going to accept this and so on. George says it's a good idea to uh, you know, be careful who you show these things to. You know, I, I do some reflective writing like that now, and I found that um, there are certain topics that if you write them freely and then mail them out, uh, don't go over too well. <laughs>
Tours von Baltasar, the great Swiss theologian. Those of you who get my contemporary theologian series, he will be the next author. It's out, coming in the mail sometime this month, I presume. But Baltasar says that he wants us, that's on the very first page under general advice. And there's a lot of good stuff in there for people who are at these higher stages of prayer life. And what Baldazar says is that when all you've got to do is concentrate on keeping your gaze on the Lord. That's his language. Gaze on the Lord. And don't let any systems get in the way. And don't get a lot of thinking in the way. In other words, all those earlier stuff I was saying gets put aside. Even the Ignatian method and the Benedictine method and all of that, that's now, you don't really need that so much anymore. And uh, relax a bit and just gaze on the Lord. And do this without hoping to get anything out of it. Don't do it so you feel better or get relaxed or get more energy or become more charitable. Just gaze on the Lord because the Lord is good. Because the Lord is uh, uh, the, the, the treasure of one's life. And don't let anybody else tell you how to do it particularly. You can have a spiritual director to listen to how you're going and so on and maybe give some guidance. But follow your own best instincts in this. Well, it, under the ball is our thing there. See a lot of uh, advice. Be confident that God is with you. Uh, think of Mary as a perfect example of this contemplative kind of prayer. Um, try to habitually throughout your day be alert to the presence of the Lord in all circumstances, good and bad. When you read the scriptures, don't uh, do so with a critical mind, as he says, or think about what Carol Schoonmiller says about it, but read uh, with an open heart your own perspectives. Be supple and pliable, he says, in the hands of God. And consider this prayer to be an end in itself. Burton says 